Okay, one of your West in the World readings this week is on this phenomenon that we call the scientific revolution. We call it that. The people who lived through it uh, didn't call it that. But looking back, we can see that there's a period of time in which there were immense strides taken in the fields of what we call science. And so this period that we call the scientific revolution uh, is usually dated as something like 1500 to 1700. We'll just be nice and round like that. Um, now, the people who were the contributors to the scientific revolution didn't, again, they didn't call them themselves revolutionaries. Uh, they didn't use that kind of language, but I think most of them knew they were living during a very dramatic, exciting period in which the human understanding of the natural world was changing profoundly. So, for instance, many of the scientists called themselves moderns, while they called their predecessors ancients. Now, it's also interesting to note that these great scholars, people like Copernicus and Galileo and Newton, did not actually call themselves scientists. That term only dates back to about 1840 or so. Rather, these people called themselves natural philosophers. And I want to point this out, because now in the 21st century, we tend to think that there's a hard, bright line between scientific disciplines like chemistry, biology, and physics, and non-scientific disciplines like philosophy, literature, and so on. Um, but that was not necessarily how people during this time saw things. And I'll go ahead and mention that two of the major figures of the scientific revolution, Blaise Pascal and Rene Descartes, you don't need to worry about them now, but we're going to be studying them next week. They were both scientists, mathematicians, but they also engaged in straight-up philosophy as well. So, again, um, I think one of the purposes of this entire course is to help us maybe rethink some of our assumptions. And the assumption that we have that hard science has nothing to do with um, these squishy disciplines like philosophy or theology, um, that's, that's a relatively recent way of looking at things. All right. So I want to help you get a handle on this material. You're going to be introduced to a lot of names, a lot of discoveries, a lot of developments. So I want to bring a little bit of order to this by pointing up five hallmarks of the scientific revolution. If you really want to understand how people in the year 1700 we're looking at the world in very different ways than people were in, say, 1300, then I think attention to these five points will be really helpful. The first point that I want to talk about, the first hallmark of the scientific revolution, is a stress on empirical observation. Empirical, E-M-P-I-R-I-C-A, L. Okay. Empirical is a fancy word for referring to sense perception. Okay, So if you observe something empirically, it means you see it with your eyes or you hear it with your ears and so on. And increasingly during this time period we call the scientific revolution, people were insisting that um, knowledge about nature must derive from empirical observation rather than sort of armchair reflection about how nature ought to work. Now, obviously, people before 1500, there are plenty of people before the year 1500 who were interested in nature and who engaged in empirical observation, who observed various natural phenomena and reflected on it. Aristotle would be a good example. I mean, you could make a, a case that Aristotle was in some ways the first scientist. Um, 
But people during the scientific revolution are going to say, well, you know, Aristotle maybe was taking a step in the right direction, but he did not go far enough. He did not go far enough in tethering all of his scientific theories directly to sense observation, empirical observation. For these scientific revolutionaries, um, the, the most trustworthy source of knowledge about nature is pure, unprejudiced observation of what actually happens in nature. So go out into the forest or go into the laboratory um, and keep an open mind and just observe what you see or hear or what have you. Discard your preconceived notions and observe, observe, observe. Now, if you want one name to associate with this newfound stress on empirical observation, let that name be Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was an Englishman who was not necessarily a great scientist himself. Certainly, he didn't make any great discoveries or anything like that, but he was a big promoter of scientific endeavors. And he believed that the best thing that people can do in his day and age, which was around the time 1600, uh, was to forget what previous scholars had said about astronomy or whatever. So for the moment, forget what Aristotle said. Forget what Ptolemy said. Go out and observe nature and see what you find. And as you do your reading in West in the World this week, you're going to find a number of examples of people during this period who are doing just that, who are going out and observing what they see and following that data wherever it leads them. So you've got people like Vesalius, uh, V-E-S-A-L-I-U-S, uh, Vesalius and William Harvey, who were great pioneers in anatomy, and they made their contributions to anatomy precisely because of empirical observation. They both conducted uh, dissections of cadavers in order to learn more about anatomy. Or you're going to read about Robert Boyle, who conducted uh, chemical, chemistry experiments, um, and uh, again, kept an open mind and simply um, observed what he observed and, and, and went from there. All right, the second hallmark of the scientific revolution is closely connected with the first. The second hallmark is an insistence on indu the inductive method. In order to understand what the inductive method is, I think it's best to start with its opposite, which is the deductive method. And the deductive method you begin with a theory, with a hypothesis, and then you go out into nature to look for confirmation, proof of that hypothesis. Okay. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, the deductive method would be like saying, okay, well, we already know, or at least we believe, that the Earth is at the center of the universe, so let's look at some astronomical data that will support that. For people like Francis Bacon, that is bad science indeed. A true scientist, or he would say a true natural philosopher, is someone who works in the other direction, who uses the inductive method. That's I-N-D-U-C-T-I-V-E. The inductive method is where you begin um, in, in, in a sort of state of doubt, right? You, you, you're not looking to prove a certain hypothesis. Rather, you want to go out and observe nature, empirical observation, build up a data, a body of data based on that observation, and then, and only then, extrapolate theories from that data, okay? So in the inductive method, you move from particulars to principles, scientific principles, rather than the other way around. Let me illustrate this by giving you a concrete example of a figure from this period 
who employed the inductive method to great success. Uh, you'll read about him. His name is Johannes Kepler, K-E-P-L-E-R. And Kepler was an astronomer, and he decided to use the inductive method. He said, okay, well, everybody has always assumed that planetary orbits are circular. But what if I don't assume that? What if I just look at reams and reams of astronomical data, and I just follow that data to whichever conclusions they lead to? So that's what he did. Uh, by the way, interestingly, everyone had assumed that planetary orbits were circular because the heavens were believed to be a realm of unchanging perfection, and the most perfect shape of all was the circle. Now, that seems very odd to us, but that was um, a very ingrained idea. Kepler decides to say, well, we'll see about that. What he discovers by looking at the data, data that was well, produced by empirical observation, what he learned, or what he um, deduced, was that actually planetary orbits are elliptical rather than perfectly circular. And he was right about that. So that's the kind of breakthrough that can happen when you use the inductive method rather than the deductive one. And this, of course, is part and parcel of what we call the scientific method to this very day. Uh, the inductive method is meant to ensure, to guarantee, that scientific knowledge is objective and unprejudiced. This seems, I think, very obvious to us, like, duh, but that's because we're the children of the scientific revolution, and the values and assumptions of the scientific revolution have been instilled in us from the time we are small children. So it seems like common sense to us, but um, it was anything but common sense in the 16th and 17th centuries. Okay, so now the third uh, hallmark or sort of guiding principle of the scientific revolution. It is an idea known as mechanism, M-E-C-H-A-N-I-S-M. Mechanism is a, a, a view sort of from the realm of physics. And mechanism holds that the behavior, the movement of all natural objects can be explained in terms of matter and motion alone. You don't need to bring anything else into the explanation. All movements of natural objects can be explained on the basis of matter and motion. Um, one of the great architects of this view of mechanism is, in fact, Descartes. And you'll be watching a lecture about him next week from Dr. Kinnison, which really focuses on his philosophical achievements. But he was also um, a, a great sort of uh, math mathematician and scientist in his own right. Now, again, we might hear something like this and think, well, of course this is true. Um, but this was a bit of a hard sell in, during this time because for hundreds of years, indeed for millennia, the views of Aristotle reigned supreme. And Aristotle believed that, that natural objects behave in the way they do because they have these innate purposes built into them. Right? And you can't see them, you can't empirically observe them, but they're there. So that's what explains, for instance, why an acorn turns into an oak tree. Because there's a sort of just innate purpose built into the acorn that leads it to become an oak tree. Um, for Descartes, this is hogwash. And it's hogwash partly because it has no empirical basis, right? And we, we've seen already how important empiricism is to these people. Um, Descartes says, uh, this is not right. Natural objects don't have innate goals or purposes. Rather, all objects are made up of certain types of matter and particles of matter, and motion is what occurs when those particles of matter collide. 
So think for a moment about a pool table. Uh, why does the billiard ball on the pool table move? Well, it moves because it is made up of a certain kind of matter, and then it collides with another ball made up of similar particles of matter. That's why it moves in the way that it does. And for Descartes, this is really an image of the entire universe. The universe is a pool table, in a sense, right? Because everything in the universe can be explained. The motion of all things in the universe can be explained simply with reference to matter and motion alone. Now, I will say, just because I, I think it's important to look ahead every once in a while, um, over time, some philosophers and scientists are going to take this view of mechanism and they're going to sort of push it. And they are going to say that really, if you follow the logic of mechanism, you end up with materialism. Now, I mean materialism as a philosophical position, uh, not as, you know, uh, an addiction to shopping or something like that. The philosophical position of materialism is one that you're aware of, even if you've never heard the term materialism. Materialism holds that matter is all that there is. Okay? The only things in the universe uh, are material things. Now, this is not, in fact, what Descartes held. Descartes, as you'll see next week, did, in the end, believe in things like God and the soul, which he believed were entirely immaterial. But what I want to suggest is that some of these um, emphases of the scientific revolution are going to help engender the phenomenon of modern materialism, and materialism is always um, going to involve atheism, right? Uh, because if God is an immaterial substance, supposedly, but matter is all that exists, well, so much the worse for God, right? Um, so if you, if you couple mechanism with this idea that empirical observation is the only true route to reliable knowledge, you can imagine why some people are going to draw atheistic conclusions from that, right? And if everything in the world can be explained in terms of matter and motion, you don't need to bring God into the picture to help explain things. You don't need that anymore. Um, now, again, I, I want to be clear that people like Descartes did not think that their views necessarily implied materialism, although some of their critics believed that it did. Um, it was still pretty hard as late as the 17th century to find a self-proclaimed atheist. But once you get beyond that, uh, you see the rise of modern atheism. And certainly it would seem that in the modern West today, atheism is on the rise, particularly in the scientific community. There's a 2009 poll conducted uh, among scientists, and it showed that about 59% of scientists in the United States uh, do not believe in God, are atheists. 59% as uh, compared to 16% of the general population who were atheists. So that raises the question, right? Why are scientists apparently so much more disposed to, um, to atheism? Now, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that the the scientific revolution inexorably, inevitably leads to atheism. But we have to try to make sense of modern atheism. Uh, and by the way, when you read Tartuffe next week, uh, there are actually going to be a couple of allusions to atheism. Um, you have to ask, where did this come from and what facilitated the rise of modern atheism. So that's my, that's my only point. I'm not suggesting um, that the scientific revolution was a bad thing or that it necessarily leads to atheism, but I think it um, makes possible uh, the rise of modern atheism. It's one factor. Okay, um, fourth hallmark 
of the scientific revolution. This is not a scientific idea per se, but it's an idea that is going to help make uh, science more and more reputable. And that is the idea that science is, scientific knowledge is politically useful. Okay. Um, now, early on in the scientific revolution, some of the very earliest figures, like Copernicus, 16th century figures, many of them were church officials um, or priests. Um, Copernicus himself was an example of this. But by the 17th century, um, many of the people who were actively sort of on the front lines of scientific research were actually employees of the state in some way or another. Um, Francis Bacon is a good example of that. Um, many of these scientists relied on royal patronage to fund their research. So they've got to convince their royal patrons that this is a good investment of money. Um, you're not going to get very far just by saying, well, you know, knowledge for knowledge's own sake is a great thing. No, you need to be able to make the case that, hey, if you sponsor and subsidize my research, um, the benefits will redound to you and indeed to the, to the state at large. And Fran uh, Francis Bacon is someone who makes that case. He was first court counselor to Queen Elizabeth I and then to King James I. Uh, and he really believed that scientific endeavor could strengthen the English state. Uh, it's actually Francis Bacon who coined the phrase that you probably heard from your junior high teacher, knowledge is power. And actually, it's, in the Latin, it is scientia es potestas, uh, science is power. Now, in that original context, Bacon was talking about God's own knowledge, but nevertheless, it is true that Bacon believed that science is power uh, in a very real sense. And he didn't mean, oh, you know, science um, empowers you to be all you can be and that, that sort of thing. No, no, no. S science um, is power, the kind of power that puts bullets in heads and the kind of power that creates strong navies and so on and so forth. Um, so for Bacon and for many others, the state that uses scientific knowledge to gain control over nature will be the master of its own destiny. And this is very much this, the, the way we still think, right? So every so often you'll hear uh, news reports about how uh, uh, test scores of American students are slipping in math and science and they're falling behind, uh, you know, the Chinese or whatever, and there's a lot of hand-wringing about this and worry about this. Um, you never hear this sort of thing uh, about things like um, the ability of American students to write a proper sonnet. Now, that's a kind of knowledge, right? The knowledge to know how to write a sonnet, a certain kind of poem. But nobody cares. Well, why do people care about math and science scores? Because uh, the assumption is that if the United States sort of slips behind in its scientific innovation, there will be negative consequences for the military, um, for uh, the weight that America can throw around in the world. Um, so I, I think this way of thinking, again, it is, it's inculcated in us from a very early age that real power is the kind of power that can make a country great and strong. Um, I'll just mention one last thing, um, that people like Bacon are highly successful in their attempts to persuade monarchs to fund scientific research. And so by the second half of the 17th century, we start to see the rise of royal societies. So these are sort of scientific societies that are funded directly by uh, the crown. You've got the Royal Society of London, founded in 1662, 
the Royal Academy of Sciences in France, 1666. The only reason these royal societies were established was because by this point, kings were convinced that scientific knowledge could, in fact, empower the state in the way that I just described. All right, fifth and finally, the scientific revolution entailed a fundamentally new way of looking at the cosmos. So a remapping of the cosmos is the, the fifth hallmark of the scientific revolution. Uh, this is, I think, the part of the story you're most familiar with, um, you know, how Copernicus uh, realizes that the Earth is not motionless at the center of the universe with everything else revolving around it, but rather it is the sun that is motionless at the center of the universe, and the Earth, like all the other planets, revolves around it. Um, so that's a pretty radically new way of thinking about the universe. Uh, other scientists are going to come after Copernicus and corroborate and buttress his heliocentric or sun-centered view of the universe. And I want to say a little something in closing about Galileo, uh, who became a staunch Copernican, and uh, this got him into quite a bit of trouble. By the way, Galileo is a great example of somebody who really believed in the importance of empirical observation. He built his own telescope. Um, he wanted to uh, build up a body of data himself. And uh, what he discovered is basically that Copernicus was more or less correct. So he gets in trouble about this. Uh, believe it or not, this was a very controversial view in the early 17th century. Now, his enemies had different sorts of motivations for trying to bring him down, but the, uh, the, the charge they bring against him is that his views directly contradict the cosmology of the Bible. And they had a point. Let me just mention a couple of verses from the Bible here. Joshua 10, 13 says, So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. The implication being the sun is usually moving, um, but at this particular moment it stood still. Uh, or 1 Chronicles 16, 20, The world, the earth, is firmly established. It shall never be moved. Right. So the earth has this sort of stationary place. Um, and I could give other examples, but uh, it would certainly seem to be the case that the Bible assumes a geocentric, earth-centered view of the universe. Now, by 1615, uh, his views were already getting him in hot water, and Galileo wrote a very interesting letter to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany, in which he tried to clarify his views on scripture and science. And he makes two main points here. The first point is that throughout history, throughout the you know, 1600 years of, of church history, scholars have not, or Christians in general, have not always interpreted the cosmological text of the Bible at face value. In other words, they've not always taken them strictly literally. So it's a kind of false choice to say, okay, well, you either need to take these texts in the Bible literally or you just have to reject them altogether as false. He wants to say, no, there may be other ways of interpreting those texts. The second point that he makes is an even deeper one. He says, look, God has given us two books, the book of the Bible and the book of nature, as he calls it. They're both from God, and they both lead us to real knowledge. But, and this is a big but, those two books are concerned with different things. And there's a very pithy quote from this letter. Galileo says, The Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. In other words, the Bible is given to us in order to guide us in matters of salvation, to know how we are to be saved. Um, the Bible is not given to us by God as a sort of scientific textbook that um, 
lays out a full cosmology of the universe. So let me just conclude by saying that part of the legacy of the scientific revolution, which is still very much among us, is that um, there are going to be these ongoing debates about the relationship between science and religion. And I think you could probably think of an example or two of debates like that that are currently quite active and lively. All right, that's it.